In this lecture, we're going to talk about objects. We're going to be actually using objects in this chapter, and then moving forward, we're going to be creating our own objects in later chapters. But for now, let's try to get an understanding of what an object is, why it's helpful to us, and then after this brief overview, we'll take a look at some code. So first of all, what is an object? Technically, an object is an abstraction that has state, identity, and behavior. And we're not really ready for this definition yet because we don't necessarily understand all of the concepts that would tie into this definition. So this is the formal definition of an object. This chapter, though, what we want to do is treat objects uh, such as they are an item we create in software that has properties and can perform predefined behaviors. So we're going to think about these things as discrete software units that we can create and then they perform some jobs for us. Remember in uh, Java we've got two different subsets of data. We have primitives that are things like integers, doubles, floats, booleans, characters, and on the other side of things we have objects. And we talked a little bit about how these things differ in terms of reference variables versus um, you know, variables that actually store the value. But now we need to understand what those reference variables are actually referencing. So remember, a primitive data can't be broken down any further. It's very discrete. An integer defines uh, an integer such as the number 7. An integer also defines that we can add, subtract, multiply, and divide an integer. Moving over to objects, it's no different, right? An object is a piece of information, so it's a set, subset of data or it is data, and we can then perform specific behaviors on that data. And the data will have some subset of properties. So we're going to create something that has properties, and then uh, we'll be able to manipulate those properties, and we'll be able to ask that object to perform behaviors for us. So objects are an abstraction. One of the nice things about this concept of objects is that um, the idea of abstraction is that we are able to simplify things that are complex. So think about something like your car. You can drive your car through this simple interface of a steering wheel and a gas pedal and a brake pedal and a shifter. Okay, but you don't need to understand things uh, about the physics of the engine. You don't need to understand about um, uh, you know internal combustion engines. Uh, the car is actually abstracting the complexities of the machine and presenting you with a simple interface. Objects do the same thing. All right? Software objects hide complexity. Another thing that would be a good example of this is if you go to an ATM machine to get money. You walk up to the machine, you put your card in, the machine is basically hiding this rather complex bank transaction that also is accompanied by this complex set of technology. Uh, for all you know, there could be a bunch of hamsters in there grabbing your card, going to a bag of money, collecting the money, and then putting it back out the slot. Like, you really don't know. The ATM machine is a black box, and it's okay. We can treat it like a black box. Same thing with software objects. We don't need to know how they work. We just need to know that they work. All right. Um, so this idea of abstraction means taking something complex and simplifying it and presenting that simplified uh, interface to our users. The way that we interact with objects, the behaviors that we interact with an object are technically called methods. A method is a behavior that's associated with an object. These need to be predefined, uh, and the object will then um, execute those behaviors. Later on, we'll talk more about methods, but some methods accept input, and other methods may provide output. So the behaviors that our objects can perform are technically called methods, and we can modify those behaviors by providing input, and we can actually reap the benefit of those behaviors by getting some output. One of the other things that we need to know about objects is that we're going to create what are called instances of objects. In other words, we need to actually build objects, and we've done that up to this point so far when we built our scanner objects and we've built uh, our string objects. So where do these objects come from? Well, objects are created from classes, and a class is like a set of blueprints. It defines what an object can be. Okay, Every object that we create from the, those blueprints is unique and independent. So let's think about this idea of an instance of an object. Somewhere, someone has gone ahead and built blueprints that define what your object should be when you've actually built it. And we build objects using the new operator, as we've seen, and we'll see in code examples here in a bit. So here are some blueprints for a stapler. All right. Unfortunately, I couldn't find a picture of this type of stapler, but we have to get this idea that someone drew out and planned what a stapler uh, is. What are the properties of the stapler? How big it is? What are the ratio of gears? The number of staples that it can hold? How it? And then they also had to define how this operates. What are the behaviors that this stapler can perform? Well, you can push down on the lever and it dispenses a staple. You can open it and reload more staples. All right. So we've got this idea of a blueprint. Every object that we create has a blueprint. Okay. And a blueprint is stored as a class file. So any class file. Um, 
is really defining a blueprint for an object. Everything in Java is technically an object, uh, but hold off on that idea for now. So when we go ahead and we build a scanner object, what we're doing is we're pulling the blueprints on the scanner object, and then we're actually building one of those. So now that we have the blueprints here for our stapler, we need to go ahead and build one. And when we call new on the stapler class, it actually goes out, builds a temporary little factory, generates a stapler, and voila, we now have an actual stapler. We can use it to stick paper together, you know, maybe, um, you know, fling staples across the room at our friends, as long as they're wearing protective safety eyewear. But the idea here is that once we have defined the blueprints, we can then go ahead and generate, using the new operator, a single instance of the stapler class. And in this case, you know, it wouldn't make a lot of money uh, you know, if we only made one uh, stapler, so why don't we go ahead and make multiple staplers? And here's really the power of this. When you define an object, when you define a class, you then have the ability to generate many, 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 many instances of that class. So kind of like if we were an automobile manufacturer, we design and, and build one car, or sorry, we design one car, we set up the blueprints, then we set up a, a production line, and we build millions of them and hopefully sell millions of them. So in this case, I'm a stapler manufacturer. I go ahead, I design the blueprints for that stapler. I then create a stapler to test it, and then from there I can free to build and build and build and build staplers. The other thing I had mentioned before is that each object's instance is unique. Uh, in other words, if I have a million staplers coming off my production line, um, and I actually, you know, throw one of those staplers out, I still have 999,999 staplers in operation, right? Like what you do to one stapler doesn't necessarily have an effect on every other stapler in the world. Kind of like my car is independent from your car. If I drive my car and my car um, is, you know, using gas, it's my car's gas tank that is being depleted not your car's gas tank, because they're two separate and unique objects. So in this case, when we create multiple objects, they're all unique, independent uh, items. Just like people are independent, unique individuals, objects are independent, unique items within software. So here are some takeaways. Objects are instantiated by using the new operator. We'll see that in some code in a second. Objects are defined by classes, but do not exist until instantiated. So we have this class that defines an object, we call new on it, and it builds an object to do our bidding. Think of yourself maybe as like evil Dr. Frankenstein or something, right? Like you've got plans for something, and then when you're ready to utilize that thing, you build it, and then it carries out your plans. Objects are independent. In other words, each object is independent of another object. If I'm running around in my gym shoes, uh, I'm not wearing your shoes because they're at you know, your house, maybe on your feet. Uh, my computer right now is recording a video. Your computer is not recording a video. So some simple philosophical ideas here that objects are independent. And what is an object? Well, at this point, we want to stick with the simplified definition that an object is a, an item in software that has certain properties and then can, can uh, perform certain behaviors uh, for us. And we'll refer to those behaviors in their technical term, which are methods. In this lecture, we want to talk about utilizing objects. We've actually been using them up to this point in the class, uh, but we'd like to take some time to talk a little bit more about what they are, how they operate, uh, and what purpose they serve for us. So what I want to do is start with the scanner object. And the first thing I'm going to do is jump up to the top of this file, and I'm going to import the scanner object package, or library in this case. What am I importing? Well, we talked about in the previous lecture that every object needs to have a set of blueprints. This import statement is actually making available to my program the blueprints for the scanner object. In other words, it's pulling in the class from the appropriate package that knows how to make a scanner object. And we can put a comment there. And we'll say the blueprints. Now, now that we have that available to my program, I can go ahead and start to create scanner objects. So I'm going to say we need to create a scanner object from the blueprints. So first thing I need to do is I need to have a place to store it. So I'm going to call my scanner object S, and then what I'm going to do is, and actually we can just copy this line down here so things are in the appropriate order. But now that I have created the variable to hold my scanner object, I'm going to go ahead and create it. And I'm going to say that line that you've seen a couple of times before. So what is really happening here? Well, everything on the right 
is the actual process of building an object from the blueprints. The assignment operator is then just going to store the object that's created into the variable named s. You see the keyword new here. New is basically the operator in Java that's utilized to take blueprints of an object and convert them into an actual tangible piece of software code that we can utilize throughout our program. Notice that the standard process here is this is called the constructor method, and we'll learn more about these later when we build them, but the constructor's job is to go ahead and upon the request of the new operator set up an object and initialize it to the appropriate format and all of this when it's done executing actually returns a valid complete usable object that's stored in this variable. What's this system dot in? Well notice that scanner is called a constructor method. We talked about methods before and some methods take input. In this case the constructor is taking a specific type of input which is indicating that we should expect the input to the program to come from standard input. In other words in this case it's going to come from the keyboard. We could also pass in a different variable or sorry a different value to the constructor and you'll see that in the chapter as well that could indicate that this scanner object should read data in from say a file on the hard disk. So really what that input is saying, what system.in is, is it's telling the scanner object upon being created by the new operator that it should initialize itself in such a fashion to accept input from the keyboard not from a file. So one more time, the new operator is what takes the blueprint and initiates the construction process this is called a constructor and the constructor contains the code for initializing this the object to its uh, default state upon creation in this case I'm actually passing in um, a modifying va uh, va value here that's basically telling this object to build itself in such a way that it accepts input from the keyboard so now what I've got here is a reference to this object and anytime I want to do something with this object Right? I just have to give a message to the object. So I'm going to prompt the user for some input and then what I'm going to do is say you know s.next and what's actually missing from my code is I need a string make some more screen space here to hold that input. And now what we're doing here is ask the scanner object to perform the next behavior. So next is a method. It's a predefined method of the scanner object. Any scanner object, once it's fully created, should be able to perform the next behavior. And so we're specifically asking, asking the scanner object named S to perform the next behavior. Is it possible to have multiple scanner objects? Sure. There's no reason why I couldn't have another scanner object called S2 in my code. Now I have two scanner objects. Well, what do you mean two scanner objects? Well, this one is set up to read data from standard input. This one's set up to read data from standard input. They are two unique and separate objects. One's named S, one's named S2. And then if I wanted to ask S2 to go ahead and perform the next behavior, I would just call it by name. And it's kind of like, you know, if you're on a sports team or you got kids, you know, you usually call things out by name. You say, hey, Jason, clean up your room. Or, hey, Bob, go out there and steal second base. So the same thing with objects is we're saying, hey, object named S, I want you to perform the next behavior. And it's going to go ahead and store that value into user input. So we can run this. And as soon as I compile it, we end up with the bytecode. If I hit run, line by line, what's going to happen is it's going to initialize these storage locations. It's going to come down to line 14 and create this scanner object. Then we're going to prompt the user for some output to enter a value and then notice that when I get to this line it calls the next behavior it asks the S object to perform the next behavior and I'm going to go ahead and put a value in there and my program exits so then the next behavior reads in the data and takes the data read in by the user and assigns it to the user input variable this is a process we've done before so I keep saying predefined methods 
Well, let's ask the scanner object to do something it doesn't know how to do. I just said steal second base. So what if we ask the scanner object to steal second base? What if we call a method called steal second base? I'm going to compile it, and guess what? I get an error that says, hey, object intro Java Online 19 cannot find the symbol steal second base. What this essentially means is this predefined behavior is not defined for the scanner object. Like, I'm asking it to do something it has no idea how to do. Uh, be like, uh, if you ask me to try and speak Italian, I can't do it, so I would not do very well at that behavior. I'd return an error. Now that we have this, we know that the scanner object uh, is an object. Now we've got a string object stored in your user input. So let's um, let's do some let's or let's better yet let's say let's ask the string object to perform some behaviors. So there's a bunch of them defined in the book. So one of the things we can do here uh, is we can look at uh, let's see let's put some print statements in here, and I'll also give you this code to follow along with. User input, oops, capital I, dot length. And I'm going to concatenate some stuff here so we know what each item is. And what I'm basically going to say is that string has blank characters. So what I've done here is I've just concatenated together some output and I'm going to ask the user input object or sorry in this case it's a string object that's stored or referenced by the user input variable so I'm going to ask the object referenced to by the user input variable to perform its length behavior and I'm going to concatenate the output of that with this string. So Let's go ahead and compile the program. I'm going to run the program so obviously it's going to prompt me for some input so you can see that down here. I'm going to enter hello Jason and then I'm going to hit enter and it went ahead and it told me that I have five characters. Anybody know why it told me I only had five characters? One, two, three, four, five and it didn't tell me that I had you know six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven characters is because when you do the next value when you call the next behavior, it actually only goes up to a space or a new line character. So if I wanted to fix this, I could just run it. Uh, and notice there's another behavior associated with the scanner or user input called next line. So now there's a behavior that the scanner object can perform that's called next line that will actually not stop going at a space. It'll actually go all the way out to the end of the line that I enter. So let's run this one more time. And this time I'll put in hello, Jason and run it and now it says I have 11 characters. Notice two behaviors that do similar things. Notice that and let's make some comments here. The next line behavior uh, reads up to a new line character which is basically the enter key. And I'm going to comment this out. And the next behavior uh, the next behavior, next method, only reads up to a space. So I've got two behaviors. If I want the whole line, I need to call the next line behavior. If I want just uh, the first bit of information up to a space, I use this behavior. So two behaviors that are similar but give slightly different um, purposes in our case. A couple other things that we can do here. And I'm going to do a few more things. So we're going to go ahead and actually find out what the first character in the string is. So instead of using the length uh, method, what I'm going to do is use the char at method. And I'm going to add some input to it. Remember I said that some behaviors accept input. Well, this method is called char at. 
It accepts a single number as input. The number corresponds with the position in the word of the character that I want to look at. So in this case, if we think of this string as a series of characters numbered left to right, the letter H is at position 0, the letter E is at position 1, the letter L is at position 2, the other L is at position 3, and so forth. So by asking for the character at position 0, it's always going to return to me the value uh, or the, the, the character at the first spot in the string. So let's run this again. And this time I'll put in JSON and hit enter. It tells me that that string has six characters because you notice I put a space in there and it tells me that the first character is J. Why? Because J is at position zero. All of these string uh, uh, methods are actually listed in your book and demonstrated. So it's important that you work through the code and start to learn all of these different uh, methods and all the, the methods that are, may be useful to you that are related to the objects that you use on a regular basis. And we'll, basically part of this class is working through um, all of the pre-written uh, or predefined data types. In other words, all the objects that come with Java pre-written. The string class is pre-written for you by the Java programmers. The scanner class is pre-written for you by the Java programmers. So what we need to do is learn of a way to actually go ahead and see what objects are available uh, to us uh, that were pre-written by the Java programmers both within the book and outside of the book and how do we learn what the behaviors and properties of those objects are so that we can start to utilize them. What's really nice about the code uh, that's pre-written for you by the Java programmers is that it, it performs a lot of tasks for you and it saves you a lot of time. So I'm going to leave uh, this lecture with just these examples and I'll post this code and you should be able to start to see more of how this works. And now what we'll do here is in the next step, we'll take a look at the Java API, the application programming interface, or basically the instruction set that shows you what are all of the predefined objects that Java provides for you and what are their properties and behaviors. So how do you find out what all of the pre-written classes are that come with Java? At this point, I'm going to guess there's about over 3,000 of these predefined objects that come with Java. In other words, there's blueprints for over 3,000 different objects that you can create and have do the, your bidding and your programs, basically. Well, if we go to the main Java website at java.sun.com, and we look for the link, the top one on there is going to be APIs. AP And then I will see the Java Standard Edition API specification. And I'm going to click on Java SE 6 because we're using the newest version of the Java Development Kit. And now what I can do is I can start to look through uh, all of the Java APIs. And actually what I want to do is I want to look through the uh, core API docs. Uh, and I'm going to look through those in English. And I want to make sure I look at version 6. What I will end up with is this frame interface. And down the left-hand side up here, you'll see all of the packages. And packages are just related uh, pieces of code. In other words, if, if a bunch of classes provide drawing information, they'll be packaged together. If a bunch of applications provide uh, statistical information, they'll be packaged together. If a bunch of applications provide network functionality, or a bunch of classes provide network functionality, they'll be packaged together as well. So packages are just um, bundles of related code. If you don't want to look at the bundles of related code, you can see every class when you log in. You could want to, you could count all of these, but it's really just a, uh, you know, an alphabetized order of every possible uh, helper class that you can build objects from in Java. So the one thing I'm going to do here is go down and I'm going to click on uh, java.util because we've imported the scanner class. So I'm going to click on the java.util package and when I click on it, notice it shows me all of the functionality that's packaged together in this bundle of code. And I'm going to scroll down until I see Scanner. And there's the Scanner class. So I'm going to click on it. And now over here in the right-hand window, I am going to notice that when I import java.util.scanner, it gives me the scanner functionality. And I can start to read about the scanner functionality. It shows me how to create a scanner object. It shows me how to read in an integer. All right. It shows me, you know, if I wanted to actually read data in from a file, it shows me how I can read, uh, use a scanner object to read data in from a file, like you'll see later on in the chapter. Uh, and it also gives me some samples of using this program in a couple of different ways. As we scroll down, the part that I find to be the most useful, uh, as you get through all of these kind of odd things, is it shows you the constructors. In other words, what different things can you put into the uh, initialization code that will modify the object for you? 
And then it shows you what I think to be probably the most important thing once you get the object created, which is what are all the methods that this object can perform? And remember, the object that I demonstrated earlier um, couldn't actually perform the, what did I say, the, the clean your room m behavior, or, you know, it didn't have defined one of these odd behaviors. But here is everything that it is defined to do. All right, it has a delimiter behavior, a find in line behavior, a has next behavior. Uh, these are all the methods that this thing can perform on. Um, a scanner object, or that the scanner object itself can perform. So it's kind of nice to see everything that's here. And you'll notice next long, next short. The one we've probably used the most is just next, and you just saw me use next line. So next is the one we've used. Notice it says finds and returns the next complete token from this scanner, um, which is just a fancy way of saying get me the next string. And then if you want, you can click on any of those. And actually, let me do that with next, just so it's a little bit easier it'll jump down to a more detailed description of exactly what that method does. Now, we don't understand things about return types yet. We don't know a lot about exception. We don't know anything about exceptions. So this thing where it says it throws this, you're going to see a lot of code in this API that we've yet to address that, that doesn't maybe make a lot of sense to you. But the reality is when someone writes a book in Java, like the textbook in class, they go to the API. This is where they get all this information. So one of the goals is you learn in any programming language, because every language has an API, you need to learn how to read the API and get comfortable with it. You might not understand what it's saying, but at some point this is going to be the best resource for you. Books are nice to get you started to demonstrate different concepts, but a lot of people um, utilize the API uh, and it's it's something you should learn to do as you become a programmer and move forward. So take a look at this. Um, if you want to double check any type of uh, information from the book, you know you can go straight to the API to verify that and then you can also start to poke around and look at the uh, different packages that might be related to your interests. If you're into game development, if you're into statistics, if you're into, you know, maybe you're into like gene sequencing or whatever background you come from, you know, you can dig through the API. These are the Sun, Microsoft, uh, Sun Microsystems provided APIs. In other words, these are the default pieces of code that come with Java. Uh, there are many people around the world writing their own packages and classes that you can go out and either purchase or download for free and integrate. But these are the core API documents, uh, much more functionality. Anybody can build um, classes and packages and give them away for anybody else to use. So as we get further into the class, we'll see how to build our own uh, classes and our own objects.